Eric Holt Jimenez is an agroecologist, speaker, and author. Of Basque and Puerto Rican heritage, he grew up in Point Reyes, California, attended the University of Oregon and Evergreen State College, graduating in 1977. Having developed an interest in sustainable agriculture development while in college, after graduation, he traveled to the state of Tlaxcala in Mexico and helped to start the Campesino y Campesino, or Farmer to Farmer, movement. He stayed involved with the farmers of central Mexico for 25 years, returning to the US only to receive a master's in agricultural development from the University of California in Davis in 1982 and a PhD in environmental studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz in 2002. From then until 2004, he taught at Boston University's International Honors Program at the, um, in, in global ecology, and in 2004 became Latin American Program Manager at the Bank Information Center in Washington, DC. Since 2006, he's been the Executive Director of Food First, the California-based Institute for Food and Development Policy. Eric has written several books, including this year's Can We Feed the World Without Destroying It, published by Polity Press in London, and last year's A Foodie's Guide to Capitalism, Understanding the Political Economy of What We Eat, with Monthly Review Press, and with Justine Williams, Land Justice, Reimagining Land, Food, and the Commons in the United States for Food First Books. After the uh, keynote, there will be a signing over under the, under the overhang uh, for some of his books if people are interested in purchasing them. I first became aware of Eric during the several years when NOFA was fighting genetically modified foods. He had a clear and thoughtful analysis of the world food situation and the role played by biotech companies in league with our land-grant universities in forcing unwanted seeds and toxic chemicals into farmers' hands. After spending a quarter of a century with resourceful farmers in Central America and Mexico, Erica holds a deep appreciation for the value and power of building local food systems. But he is quite aware that working locally is never going to be enough to bring about the larger changes that are needed. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you this scholar and activist who has spent his life working for a fair and healthy food system, Eric Holt Jimenez. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Not too good? Yeah. Great. Um, well, it, it's an honor to be here, and I really want to thank NOFA for this invitation. Um, I used to farm. Uh, and I used to do farm work. I sort of started out my life doing farm work and did it sort of until my back couldn't take it anymore. Um, I grew up on, uh, on dairy farms in Northern California. Uh, these were old uh, Portuguese style, Portuguese immigrants had come and, and Italian immigrants had come into Northern California into Marin County and, colonized the area it, when the land was cheap. <laughs> it's not anymore. Uh, and um, my stepdad had a fishing boat, and, and uh, I'd go out on the fishing boat, and that wasn't very good business, actually. Um, but uh, we lived on farms, so we never had a farm. But I grew up on these farms and, you know, just did what the other farm kids did. And I thought it was great. Um, you know, you got to drive tractors, and uh, you got to drive the truck into town and pick up beer and cigarettes and take them back out, you know, to the other workers and whatnot. Uh, and I didn't really see it as work. I saw it actually as a lot of fun. And my favorite project was um, scooping out and hosing down 
the uh, waiting stall for the cows, where all the manure was. And you know, they wait before they go into the milk barn. And as they wait, they kind of shit and shit and shit and shit. And um, afterwards, someone had to come in and scoop all that out and then hose it down and make it nice and clean. And for some reason, that was my favorite job. Um, you know, I was only, what was I, I 10. And, um, but I thought that was the best job ever. And um, I always kind of wondered, you know, where does all that shit go? <laughs> you know, kind of scrape it to the end, then hose it down, and it kind of disappeared out that way. And I asked the farmer about it, the rancher, and he said, um, yeah, don't worry about it. It goes out into a big pile. It's always been there. It goes out into this big ravine. And uh, I said, well, you know, what's it like? I mean, how big is it? I mean, what happens to it? He said, look, just don't worry about it and don't go out there. <laughs> so, I, I don't know if it was the next day, but... Um, <laughs> I went out there with my dog and my BB gun and my milk boots, you know, rubber boots up to my knees. And uh, we went down to the ravine on one side and came up, and sure enough, I, I found the, the big pile of manure. And, um, you know, down at the bottom and on the edge there, was, it was pretty dry. And then it was grown up with a lot of lush wild carrot and, and other weeds and whatnot. So I started climbing to the top. And as I climbed up to the top, you know, getting closer to the top, my dog, dog started barking and barking, and I just kept right on going. And it, you know how it is, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you ever seen lava crusts and stuff? Oh, have you ever seen manure crusts? It, they're kind of, they're hard, you know? And if you're light, you can kind of walk on them like tiles until you sink. And so I sank. At one point I just sank, like, right up to my armpits. Um, and I looked around, and I, I remembered those cowboy movies, you know, where the cowboy falls in the quicksand, and he kind of hooks his rifle around the tree, or calls, you know, calls his horse, you know? And I called my dog, and he wasn't coming in, in there. <laughs> and um, so I, I gotta get out of here somehow. Somehow I, you know, I moved around, and I grabbed some weeds, and I, I think I dug my BB gun into the, into the manure and pushed myself over and sure enough I got up and out but I left my boots <laughs> and that's when I realized I was in deep shit <laughs> and I share this little story with you brothers and sisters because I just want to say we are in deep shit you probably noticed and I don't have to enumerate all the ways in which our planet, our people, our country, our farms, our food system um, is facing uh, historical challenges, planetary challenges, challenges which if you really push experts, they don't know if we can solve these problems. Um, and so what I want to talk to you uh, today about is where I think we fit in. I don't know if we can solve these problems. But I think there are some very interesting ways that we can try if we understand we're up, up, we're up against. You know, before I um, start, I realize I... I'm remiss because I should have started, and I apologize for not starting where I should have started, which is first to um, recognize that we stand on indigenous land, and I want to honor the indigenous peoples upon whose land we stand. I also want to honor the enslaved Africans who labored on this land and who brought value to this land. I want to honor the indentured servants who also gave their labor to this land. I want to honor all of those who farm today, all of you who feed us. And I especially want to honor women. Thank you for inventing agriculture 10,000 years ago. Do foodies need to know about capitalism? 
The answer is, of course, yes. Everyone trying to change the food system, people trying to end hunger, food insecurity, and diet-related diseases, as well as those working for equitable and sustainable agriculture, and people who simply want to access good, healthy food, need to know about capitalism. Why? Because we have a capitalist food system, and yet relatively few people seem to recognize this. This seems odd, particularly for those who identify with the food movement. After all, one wouldn't start farming without some notion of growing plants, or build a website without knowledge of web software, or roof a house without understanding construction. Yet many, if not most, food activists trying to change the food system have scant knowledge of its capitalist foundations. In part, this is because most people in the food movement are too busy trying to deal with the immediate problems of the food system. Understandably, they concentrate their efforts on one or two issues rather than the system as a whole, such as healthy food access, urban agriculture, organic farming, community-supported agriculture, local food, farmers' rights, animal welfare, pesticide contamination, food sovereignty, GMO labeling, the list is long. So I'm not here today to say, let's not work on those things. I'm here today to say, let's keep working on all those things. But let's think about capitalism. Because every thing, single thing we do, every single limitation we face, some of the opportunities have to do with capitalism. So if we understand how our capitalist food system works, then we're in a much better position to change it. And I think what's really important for us, particularly those of you who are farmers, and you probably already have a good notion of this, is to understand where does food and farming fit in to the capitalist system? Because our society is largely organized around how we produce and consume. But that means that how we produce and consume can determine how we organize our society. So I think that farming and the food movement and the food system is key not only to understanding how capitalism works, but how we might be able to change capitalism. You know, in this country, there's only about 2% of the population farms. We have more people in prison than we have on the land. Farmers don't have any political power as farmers. There's not enough of you. Now, it's different if you go to some countries in the global south where farmers are 60, 70% of the population you know, organize those farmers and do something, government has to listen. They don't have to listen to us. But it doesn't mean that this sector is not pivotal in terms of society, in terms of the economy, in terms of our culture. It is. But we have been depoliticized, and much of our political power has been taken away. You look at the Farm Bill, for example. I mean, that thing, you ever try to change that? Food first, we've been working on that since I can remember. They're not gonna let you touch that. The Farm Bill is a pillar of late capitalism. They're not gonna let, you let us mess with it. It's surrounded and insulated and protected by committee after committee so that democracy cannot touch the Farm Bill. That's how important agriculture is. And that's how important you are. So we have a, a, some challenges because of the lighting here. And I'm, I'm going to go through some of these slides. Um, I, should have, I should have brought in more text-heavy slides rather than image-heavy slides. But we're going to do our best. So anyway, we're going to talk about capitalism and the political economy of our food system. 
No, we can't, actually. That's just the way it is. It's like the farm bill. <laughs> so I'm from Food First, and we're a people's think tank. We do nerdy things like research and publications, but we also work with social movements. We've been around for 42 years. We were started by an extraordinary woman named Frances Moore LePay. How many people read Diet for a Small Planet? <laughs> this is the generational divide. So how, how many people under 30 read Diet for a Small Planet? There's one, two. Three, four, ah, see, this is a crowd. You didn't read it, you just put your hand up. Okay, so Frankie said two things that were revolutionary back in 1975. She said, we, people in the world, aren't going hungry because of scarcity. They're going hungry because they can't afford to buy the food. They're going hungry because they're poor. And later on, she developed that thesis, why are they poor? Because of injustice. Right? So that's the first thing, that hunger is not due to scarcity. Because back in 1975, there were 650 million people going hungry in the world. That was one in seven. And yet we were producing one and a half times more than enough food to feed every man, woman, and child on the planet. The other revolutionary thing, she said, was we're eating too high on the food chain. The way we're producing this food is causing too many environmental problems. We eat too much meat, and we're polluting too much with our forms of production. That was actually revolutionary. So fast forward to today. And Actually, that's not today. How much food do you think we produce today? How many people are going hungry today? One in seven people are going hungry. We produce one and a half times more than enough food for every man, woman, and child on the planet. So what Frankie had done, um, without even thinking about it, and she promises me that she has never read Karl Marx and isn't going to, um, but she had identified the first and second contradictions of capitalism. So the first contradiction of capitalism is between capital and labor. And that just basically means that when capital borrows <laughs> labor's labor power, because labor lends their labor power, the worker lends his or her labor power to the capitalist, Capitalist uses that labor power to produce something, and then later on pays the worker for that labor, right? Um, they produce things, but they produce more than what the worker can consume because the worker's wage don't, wages don't allow it to produce all the things, to consume all the things that they produce. So capitalism naturally overproduces. Right? That leads to intense competition. And as you overproduce, what happens? The price of things go down. So the capitalist then is getting less money. So they're forced to expand into new markets. And they may be forced to destroy their competitors one way or another. Um, so capitalism is always dealing with this sort of crisis of overproduction and the need to continually expand. It just can't sit still. It has to reinvest its profits. Capital, what capital really is, is wealth in search of more wealth. Capital is always moving. Hmm? There is no steady state capitalism. Forget it. Um, and that leads to all kinds of things, like overproduction, and underemployment, and extractivism, and what they call primitive accumulation, which basically means stealing, um, and speculation, as we have seen with our food supply. But then the other contradiction of capitalism is ecology, it's ecological. Because capitalism is so destructive and so extractive, it destroys the resource base upon which it depends. So it destroys it in one place and it's gotta move somewhere else and it destroys it somewhere else. This has happened for all of our rivers, happened to our soils, 
And happens in the first world, they go down to the third world, destroy that. Um, so you get this overshoot and you get pollution and now we've got global warming thanks to this, and diminishing resources. This all comes from what's called the metabolic rift. And with a metabolic rift, it's very simple. And this is thanks to agriculture and industry. So what happens is that we farm in one place, all the nutrients in the food go to another place, a city where they're consumed, and then they're sloughed off into the rivers or the ocean. Now, this was identified back in the 1700s that this was a problem. And as Europe began to industrialize, people really began to complain. What can we do about this? This is terrible. Um, well, first they dug up all the bones from the battlefields of the Napole Napoleonic Wars and began to fertilize with those old bones. Then they discovered guano. You get this thing called guano imperialism. And the British Isles and later the United States go all around the world colonizing islands that have bird shit on them. And then they uh, bring slaves and prisoners and indentured servants and just people whom they steal here and there to go to these islands and they work them to death, uh, digging out the guano so that Europe can resolve its metabolic rift problem and the nutrient deficiency. And so, as capitalist agriculture begins to develop, it does two things. One is, it shoves all the peasants off the land. Not all, most. Why? Because they need them in the factories. And also because they need that land. So what happened was someone invented the steam engine, and then someone invented the spindle, and they start, have these factories where they're producing textiles made of wool. But the problem is that the peasantry, you know, they were producing food, and they had the commons, and they were living in their villages, and they would not produce the wool that the factories wanted. So come the enclosures. The lords of the manors enclosed the common lands upon which peasant villages depended enormously for, for um, fuel and medicinal plants and to graze their animals. And then they taxed the peasantry for the land that they were on. Well, the peasantry didn't have any money and they had greater need because they couldn't produce as much anymore. So they went into the factories. And then as they begin to dispossess the peasantry of their land, they start growing sheep. The manors start growing sheep. Land begins to concentrate, and they produce the wool for the factories. People will work to death in the factories. Um, so this is part of the metabolic rift as well. Right? This is part of the first um, contradiction between uh, capital and labor as well. Right? So they destroy the peasantry. And of course, we know what happens with those peasants too. They come here. Most of your ancestors come from what is called the agrarian transition. The agrarian transition where the peasantry was forced off the land in order to make way for industrial agriculture. Then first they industrialize the cities and then agriculture itself becomes industrialized with what's called high farming in which the rich farmers are able to use some of the peasant labor and the bat shit and the, and the bird shit to fertilize and export. That's the beginning of industrial agriculture. That was the green revolution of the 18th century. This is called the agrarian transition. It's about dispossessing small farmers of their land so that industry can concentrate its control and its wealth over the means of production. Very capitalist thing to do. Capitalism emerges with, could not have emerged without the agrarian transition. Now, it wasn't like farmers just sat back and said, oh, geez, guess we gotta go to the factories and work for, you know, 17 hours a day and die by the time we're 20. They fought. 
people fought. They fought for over a century against the agrarian transition. They fought against capitalism. They fought for their land, for their people. They fought so they wouldn't be dispossessed. They fought so they wouldn't have to immigrate. They hung on as long as they could. They created alliances. And this is really very important. Because you wouldn't have thought that the peasantry would have created alliances with the aristocracy. But they did. Because the emerging bourgeoisie, who had con control over the industrial means of production and the banks, mm, was advancing the industrialization of society and advancing the agrarian transition and dispossessing the aristocracy of their power. So the peasants actually allied with the aristocracy. And that's one reason they were able to hang on as long as they could. And it's also one reason that the agrarian transition wasn't bloodier than it was. I'll, I'm going to come back to that because I think there are a lot of parallels in this historical account for what we're facing today. So here we have two different forms of agriculture, organic and industrial. And you know, it's really sort of, there's a caricature of what this looks like. And you guys have all heard it. Maybe, maybe it works for you, I don't know. Small versus big, local versus global, organic versus chemical, community versus corporations, people versus profit, authentic versus productive, traditional versus modern, idealistic versus scientific, expenses, expensive versus cheap. So we know which one is expensive and we know which one is cheap. We also know where the real costs lie, don't we? There's so many reasons why we should have small farms and organic, sustainable agriculture. This is not new, this is very, very old. And yet, why are they always shot down? Why is there always an argument to uh, undermine the viability, the sustainability, and really sort of the, the humanity of small, organic, sustainable farms. So the problem really isn't scarcity. The problem is poverty. Now, who's poor? And where are the poor? You know, the poorest people in the world? Farmers. In fact, the farmers producing over half of the world's food are the poorest people in the world. And most of those farmers are women and girls. So women and girls feed over half the world on less than 25% of the agricultural land, and they make up 70% of the world's hungry. Don't tell me we live in a post-sexist society. We also don't talk about hunger in rich countries. How many people are hungry in the United States? One in seven. We don't call it hunger, we call it food insecurity. One in seven. It mirrors hunger on, on a global scale. In the richest country in the world, which produces more food than anybody else. So, that's why we're here. You have been responding to this. We've all been responding to this. And I think this juncture between organic agriculture and food justice is especially important. Because all these incredibly innovative ways of producing and distributing consuming food are coming out right out of the belly of the beast. And you know what they are. This is all fantastic. So if we care, and what does it respond to? Our food insecurity. And you can see that it's localized. You can see where it's, we have more food insecurity, mostly in the states where we grow more food. By the way, uh, food workers are among the most insecure people in the United States. And food workers also tend to be people of color. So the highest levels of food insecurity are among people of color and food workers. And, as I'm sure many of you know, among many farmers. 
We're not so different from the rest of the world. Now, the rest of the world used to be a lot different from us until the Green Revolution spread the northern uh, mode of agriculture and the northern food system from the north to the global south. Well, we know what this results in. We call them externalities. That just means that all the damage which is done by industrial agriculture is not paid by industrial agriculture. Monsanto doesn't pay, Syngenta doesn't pay, Cargill doesn't pay, um, Smithfield Tyson doesn't pay for everything that they pollute or all the damage they've done. You've heard that uh, just yesterday the court ruled in favor of an African-American worker who has a lymphomatic um, cancer thanks to Monsanto's glyphosate products, and they won. They won that case. Now comes the appeal. Now, this should concern all of us. The man's going to die. He knows he's going to die. But he's putting up one big last fight before he dies against this. So thanks to the spread of industrial agriculture around the planet, we now lose up to 70 billion tons of soil each year. And all of the ecosystem services that go along with that increase that number much higher. We're losing our fossil water, you know, our, our ancient aquifers that you can't replenish only in long-term geological time. We're losing those around the world, especially the Punjab in India, where they pilot, piloted the Green Revolution. And just here in the United States, the Midwest, the Ogallala aquifer is being lost. We've lost 90% of the world's agrobiodiversity. Um, you know, they monitored it just in Germany, this field next to uh, some industrial farms. And over the last uh, 10 years or so, they've seen a 75% decline in flying insects. Insects are the canaries in our mine shaft. Um, and then, if, if you've been following what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, the, I don't know how much, millions of tons of dead fish on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico um, is because of the red tide, eutrophic zone. That is largely thanks to two things. In general, structurally, it's thanks to metification. It's thanks to the CAFOs, um, where all that effluent goes down the, the Mississippi River, metabolic rift, remember? And it's also thanks to the fact that the planet is warming, and now uh, the Gulf of Mexico is getting warmer, and so we get these algae blooms uh, phytoplankton uh, toxicity, uh, eutrophic dead zones growing bigger and bigger. We also global food waste. Just a quick note on global food waste. I'm not going to get into it too much. Um, we do waste something like 400 billion a year, uh, and you know anywhere from um, 30 to 50 percent, depending on whether it's the rural or urban, the global south, the global north different reasons why poor people, rich people, um, young people, old people, people of color, white people, all have different levels of waste. The point is, now there's all these projects to recover this waste. Hmm? Buying up the ugly fruit and selling the ugly fruit and taking the waste and, and uh, using it for animal feed and this and that. But no one asks, why do we have all this waste? Like, if you were really concerned about the waste, you know, and all of the resources, water and energy, and whether they get wasted along with it, if you were really concerned about it, like, wouldn't you want to say, why do we have waste? We have waste because of capitalism. Capitalism overproduces. Farmers overproduce. They produce more in good years and more in bad years because they're worried about going broke. They produce more in bad years because, I mean, when, when prices are low, because they have high fixed costs and they got to make up their losses. They produce more in good years because I better make more money now because who knows what's going to happen to me next. Mm -hmm. Supermarkets keep at least from 50 to 100 percent more food on their shelves than they can sell. So waste is an integral part of the capitalist food system from farm to fork. Look at all the packaging and stuff that we get. And then the, the um, when, they, when they say that, that, that it's overdue, what do they call, what they call that? The, yeah, the expiration date and all that business. That's to be able to sell it faster. It has nothing to do with the quality of the food.
But that's part of capitalist agriculture. So look, ever, over the last century, this is the um, food price index. We started measuring it in 1900. So you can see the food price index over the last century has been going steadily down with a few spikes around World War I and World War II um, and the 1974 oil crisis. You get these little peaks. But in general, it's been coming down. Why? Because we've been overproducing food. That makes it cheap. That's why the price of food has been coming down until 2008. And suddenly it shot up beyond anything we'd seen for over a century. Did food suddenly become scarce? No. 2008, we had record harvests worldwide, but we had record hunger. Millions of people were ushered into the ranks of the hungry. And we, we'd never had so many hungry people before, over a billion people hungry. And there were record profits by the oligopolies who control our food system. Mm. There they are, my favorites. ADM, Monsanto, Cargill. But also by the retailers, General Foods, Walmart, mm. Tesco, Carrefour. These all made windfall profits. At the time, a billion people were going hungry in the world. So it looks like this. There's the red line. 2008, you get this spike in food prices. It drops, but then it goes up again in 2011. That's the red line. Right? And the blue line is the retail price. So one is the world price, world market price for food, food basket. But the other is the retail price, what consumers pay. So it goes up with the red line in 2008, 2009, and, but then it drops. I mean, like the red line drops, but the blue line stays the same. So the retailers were not paying more for the food they were buying. The processors were not paying more for the food they were buying, they were paying less. And yet, the retailers were charging more. This is called gouging. It should be illegal. While a billion people were going hungry. Just quickly to show you what a capitalist food system really, how perverted it really is. On the right there, you see another blue line. It goes up, it comes back down, it starts to go up again. What do you think that is? That's the share price of Monsanto's stock. Now, this is the same type of line you would look at for any of the big corporations. Their stock value goes up as people go hungry, and as people are fed, their stock value goes down. So what do they need? They need food crises. They need volatility. That's because capitalist food system is not based on need. It's based on demand. That's why we have over a billion people going hungry. They have a need for food, but they don't have money to express that need in market demand to buy the food. There was a lot of talk about all these proximate causes. Why did this happen? How could this happen? Fast forward down to the bottom line. It happened because of financial speculation the commodity index funds. The hedge funders were playing roulette with our food. The root cause, of course, is that we have a food system which is highly vulnerable to both environmental and economic shock. And the reason is, on one hand, it's, con the, it's concentrated with just a few, I'm talking about the global food system now, concentrated in just a few crops, five crops, over 90% of the cropland. And it's concentrated in just a handful of oligopolies. So going back to the contradictions of capital, contradiction of labor and capital, and the second contradiction of uh, environment and capital, it's here again, very plain for us to see. I've been talking about what is essentially what we call the corporate food regime. Now think about a food regime as all of the institutions and the rules which govern our food system. So what's one big institution? The USDA. What's one big rule? The Farm Bill. Mm -hmm. um, but 
you go on from there, some of the big, all of the big oligopolies are part of the food regime. And the food regime is nothing new. There was a colonial food regime, um, which colonized the global south from the global north. The south provided cheap food and cheap raw materials so the north could industrialize mm -hmm. under the yoke of colonization. Um, and then we had the Keynesian food regime, that's after World War II when all of the, um, all of the nitrates from the bombs and all of the chemicals from the chemical warfare were, then were turned into agricultural products. Nitrates into fertilizer, the chemicals into um, pesticides, right? And then we sell them first to our farmers and we loan them the money to buy this stuff and when they can no longer absorb any more of it, then we sell it to Europe through the Marshall Plan. And when they can't um, absorb any more of it, and everybody's producing way too much food, and the price of food, around, then we break down the markets in the global south um, using food aid as, as a lever um, to drive farmers there out of business so then we can establish um, industrial forms of farming in the global south and sell all these products. Right? It had nothing to do with ending hunger. It had to do with a crisis of accumulation of industrial products in the north that farmers couldn't buy anymore and they had to sell them in the south. So that's through the Green Revolution. Then we have the structural adjustment policies of the 80s and 90s. So what happened? The global south gets all this stuff. They borrow money from banks in the north. They buy all this machinery and the fertilizers and the pesticides and the irrigation equipment and they get big. There's an agrarian transition. The big guys push the little guys off the land. And farmers in the United States, same thing happens. Earl Butts said, plant, plant fence row to fence row. Rip out the fence rows. You gotta save the world from hunger. Buy these things to save the world from hunger. And they did. I'm not talking about you. You're innocent. But they did. And what happened? Tremendous overproduction. The price of food drops down so low that farmers go broke. So farmers go broke here, and that's where we lose half of our farmers. They go from 4% to 2% of the population. In the global south, whole countries went out of business. They couldn't pay back the banks. So the World Bank steps in to loan the money to the country. That's our money, by the way, World Bank paid for with our taxes. They loan our money to the governments in the global south so they can pay the interest on their loans to Wall Street. Um, but they had to sign some agreements called the Structural Adjustment Policies. And they said, devalue your currency, privatize your schools, your health system. Right? Sound familiar? Then they said, dismantle all your grain reserves. We don't really want you growing food. No, not real food. Not food that your people eat. Grow flowers. Grow chocolate. Yeah, grow cacao. Grow these things that you can export and get dollars for and pay back the banks. So we essentially destroyed the economies down there. And then to come in behind those structural adjustment policies were the fair trade agreements, which cemented those policies into international treaties. Why? because people didn't like the policies. And they were voting the politicians out who had signed the structural adjustment policies. But now, they're in NAFTA, they're in CAFTA. They're in the World Trade Organization. Just like the Farm Bill, they're not gonna let us mess with that. Well, we all know the results. The global south became dependent on the global north for its food. Went from producing a billion dollars in export of food to importing $11 billion a year of food. Tremendous migration of farmers out of Mexico, out of Central America, coming to the North because their economies have been destroyed by NAFTA and CAFTA. Because we subsidize grain production here and we dump it down there and they can't compete. Um, a spread of diet-related diseases, bad enough in this country, now going around the planet and, of course, very high um, emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, agriculture, industrial agriculture produces about anywhere from 30 to 40 percent, depending on how you measure it, and so driving global warming. But I think the biggest loss in the South 
and here in the North. And this whole process has been the loss of the public sphere because they've privatized everything. They've privatized our relationships. They've privatized our minds. I was in a session this morning talking about the difficulty of NOFA to provide a living wage to the people who work for NOFA. As if this, I mean, this tremendous burden on NOFA. Well, you know what? If you didn't have to pay for your education, if you didn't have to pay for your health care, if you had decent rent control or subsidized uh, housing, you wouldn't have to have a higher wage. So see, all those costs have now been placed on us. Now the little guy's got to pay for everything, because the big guys don't want to pay for anything. And that's because of the loss of our public sector and the loss of our public sphere. We no longer make decisions on the basis of debate, analysis, agreement, voting. No, the market makes all our decisions for us. And all that means is that who's ever got the most market power gets to make the decisions. Now, organic farmers in this country, family organic farmers, small-scale organic farmers, because it's also being industrialized, as you know, um, are a bit like the marginalized farmers in the global south. The difference is that they're a higher percent of the population than you are. Hmm. They got a little bit more clout. They're poor, but there's a lot of them. And if they mobilize, you have to listen to them. But in many ways, you, you're doing the same things. You're looking for niches. You're trying to get off the pesticide treadmill, off the fertilizer treadmill, trying to establish different markets that serve your purposes, not the interests of the global, of the global market. Very much the process of the agrarian transition spread across the whole world has actually brought you together with farmers around the world. So you may feel like you're in the minority in this country, but globally, you're in the majority. Most farms in the world are not big. Most farms in the world are small. Most farms in the world do not use industrial inputs. You're part of the majority. What are you gonna do about that? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm way behind. Um, this was the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development. It was a World Bank study with 300 scientists. It took five years. Uh, Syngenta actually asked them to do this. And then when they came out with this um, conclusion, they got mad and they walked out. Um, and then the World Bank shelved the, the study. But you should look for it. It's very interesting. Because this is basically what they say. And they said, GMOs don't really help that much. They also said that the structural adjustment policies don't really help that, the poor that much. But what could really help would be agroecology, organic agriculture, and small-scale food systems, locally-based food systems. That could draw the world out of poverty and end hunger and reduce environmental destruction. So, a lot of people talk about, oh my God, this is terrible. This food system is broken. We've got to fix it. It's not broken, brothers and sisters. It's not broken. It's dysfunctional. It works for the rich, not for the poor. It doesn't work for you guys so much. It's working exactly as a capitalist food system is supposed to work. It's doing its job. It's not broken. And this is really very important because you say, well, you've got to fix it. You know, we'll fix it to what it was before? To when? To during slavery? Fix it to the beginning of the Bracero program? Fix it to when it was based on indentured servitude? No. It's never been broken. It's always been working. So that means we have to build something new. Um, and that means is that we are looking at a new agrarian transition and we have to decide which way are we going to go. Because the capitalist agrarian transition is very clear. Um, big, big systems data, concentration in larger and larger farms, um, hydroponics, We're talking about this over lunch, you know, taking the labor out of farming. You know, roboticization of farming, um, you know, satellite farming, 
connected to the tractor, tells it how much to apply a fertilizer or whatever. Now, you may think this has nothing to do with you, but this does because it will affect the entire food system. It's not just the techniques that are changing. The entire food system is changing and concentrating even more. And we know historically what that means for small farmers. It means that they're going to drive you off your farm. And they can do it through the market, or they can do it at the point of a gun, as how it's usually done in Latin America, for example. Um, but that is the new agrarian transition. So what we need is a people's agrarian transition. We need an organic agrarian transition. We need an agroecological agrarian transition based on completely different principles. Um, so I talked to you about the corporate food regime, and I, I'm going to go over it a little bit. The, um, we know some things about capitalism. We've been studying it for a couple hundred years. Hmm. I know they don't teach it in school, but they teach economics, which is not, you don't learn anything about capitalism by studying economics. Um, but it goes through two periods. Capitalism always goes through a period of liberalization and a period of reform. And I'm telling you this because I probably depressed the hell out of you, and I want to give you something hopeful. During a period of liberalization, um, I'm not talking about social liberal values around, uh, I don't know, gay marriage or immigration or anything like that. I'm talking about market liberalization. During a period of liberalization, capitalism takes the gloves off the market, deregulates. No environmental regulations, no labor regulations, no financial regulations. Capital flows all around the world however it wants, but it ends up destroying. Markets eventually destroy society if they're not regulated. And sooner or later, people can't take it anymore, and they rise up, and they say, enough. Stop with the overproduction. Stop with the privatizing. Stop with the dispossession. Stop with the underemployment. They form unions. They form huge political parties. They take to the streets. Last time this happened was in the 1930s. So we had a period of liberalization in the roaring 20s, and then the Great Depression. A big crash, the Great Depression. This always happens. It's happened many times in the history of capitalism. And then you get a period of reform in which the market is controlled, production is controlled, social services are reintegrated, into the economy. Hmm. Only if you have a strong counter movement, a strong social movement. So back in the 30s, we did. It, it, it looked like this country was going to fall. It looked like capitalism was going to fall. And so Roosevelt sat down with a big business of the day and said, gentlemen, do you want to, do you want a smaller piece of the pie or do you want to lose the whole pie? because I can't hang on to this much longer. And so he introduces the New Deal. This is, I'm gonna end with this incomprehensible uh, chart and a quote from George Naylor. Look, the social movement around the world is growing. The counter movement around the world is growing. You have the climate justice movement, you have the women's movement, you have the food movement. You had the food sovereignty movement. And I think that these movements are absolutely essential for building a strong counter movement. Because if we have a strong counter movement, we can, pre we can create political will. It was a strong counter movement which created the political will for FDR to introduce the New Deal. Otherwise, he couldn't have done it. We need a movement which is that strong. And I think that the food movement is especially important because what you're doing may seem small, but in fact, everything you do at your farmer's markets, in your CSAs, in your farm to school programs is rebuilding the public sphere, is rebuilding that part of society where we decide, not the market, us. And the food movement is really special and really good at doing this. So keep on doing what you're doing. Keep on doing everything that you're doing. But now what we have to think about strategically is building the alliances. Because in an agrarian transition, 
The small farmers need alliances. Historically, it has always been so. So we need to build alliances amongst ourselves and with other movements. Otherwise, we won't be strong enough to create the political will, not just for reforms, but for transformative reforms. Because we want to be going back and forth like this forever. The planet won't take it. Communism is no longer a threat, but global warming is. Mm. What's keeping us from building the reforms, from building the, the alliances? Well, it's hard to do, otherwise we would have done it by now. But I'll just say, and this time I really will end, that there are some very basic barriers, obstacles to building alliances. And I'll just tick them off. Racism, sexism, classism. And you can go on with some other isms if you like, but historically, these are the three barriers to alliances. We have to dismantle racism in the food system. Otherwise, we can't build alliances. We have to recognize the leadership of people of color and indigenous, indigenous peoples. We have to fight for things like reparations. We have to develop platforms where we can all come together as a strong alliance. We have to support the empowerment of women. They are the ones who feed us worldwide. So it means that we have to dismantle sexism. We have to dismantle white patriarchy. And here I am as a white man telling you this. It means that I have to work on me. Because not only do you have to dismantle it in the food system, we have to dismantle it in the food movement, in our own organizations, and within ourselves. And it's hard. I get it. It's hard. I come from a mixed race family. We have to deal with this all the time, and we've been through therapy dealing with this. And essentially, you have to get down to that level. White people, we've got to lose our guilt. But we've got to do the work to lose the guilt. We're not any help if we're guilty. And folks of color are working on getting rid of internalized oppression. And it's because of that, because of those things, because of that work, we'll be able to build a powerful movement. So dismantling racism, sexism, and classism is not extra work that you do after farming or that you do after you go to the meeting for your CSA. It is the work. And the sooner we recognize that, the sooner we can politicize our movement and create the political will that we need to make the changes not only that agriculture needs, but this planet desperately, desperately needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any of your questions and answers? A couple. Yeah. Yes, uh, question or two. Uh, Anybody want to jump up, ask a question or two? Thank you to Eric Holtumanis. Yes, over here, Ben. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for your illuminating discussion of the capitalist food system. Since the last election cycle, there's been a lot of growth of interest in socialism as an alternative to the capitalist system. I'm wondering if, uh, you have anything to say about the future of a socialist food system? So our social systems have, since, um, basically since the 18th century, have always been a combination of socialism and capitalism. It's just that when capitalism is dominant, it invisibilizes the socialist aspects <laughs> which allow it to operate. Capitalism couldn't operate and can't operate 
um, if it destroys all of the socialist relations um, which exist within our society. Um, so there's always going to be um, some socialism and some capitalism within whatever uh, our society or our food safety system happens to be. I think that capitalism is, is really becoming um, delegitimized, and for good reason. I mean, <laughs> look at all these billionaires. Uh, and we're going to have a trillionaire this year, you know? And this is absurd. Um, and young people today didn't live through the Cold War. So they're not as um, freaked out about the notion of socialism. Um, and, they, and I think what's very clear is that, you know, socialism is going to have to be reinvented um, because many of the ways that socialism was implemented, of course, didn't work very well. Well, neither is capitalism. So it just doesn't let us, let us off the hook. I think that we have to very um, consciously study and very um, conscientiously implement socialist um, uh, mechanisms within our uh, very immediate uh, social systems and um, to, to begin to reinvent our economy. I, and I think that there's a lot to be learned and just recognize, you know, it was never that we didn't have it. It's always been around. We just have to recognize it and retool it. I think we have time for another one or uh, two. One more. There's a What's woman it? here in the right. Is it? Eric, she wants you to push your book. Oh. Thanks, Eric. I was really excited to hear about the movement building you talked about and wondering if you could speak to how you believe cooperatives fit into that. Mm. So I had the privilege of addressing the um, CCMA, the uh, Consumer Cooperative Management Association, a, a few months ago in Portland, a crowd about this size, I think, maybe a little bigger. Um, and I was really surprised because it was very technical. I went to, the, to the, some of the workshops and they were really, really technical, you know? And I'm like, are you sure you want me? I mean, I, you've seen what I write, right? You've seen me speak, you really want me? Yeah, 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 we want you to speak, okay. So I gave something very similar to what I shared with you today. And they reacted the way you did today. And the reason is because cooperatives actually have a very long history of confronting capitalism. The very first cooperative founded on the Rochdale Principles, was founded by ex-artisans and crafts, craftsmen who um, had been displaced by the Industrial Revolution and who were starving. And so, so they formed the Cooperative Society. So they were part of a counter-movement against capitalism. And then if you look at, um, at this country during Reconstruction and in the Global South, cooperatives played a fundamental role in allowing African Americans to accumulate rural wealth to the point where without a dime from the government, they were able to accumulate 15 million acres of land during the Jim Crow era. So cooperatives have an essential role to play in the reconstruction of our food system, but it's a tool and it's a powerful tool. And we have to ask, are we gonna use our cooperatives to reconstruct a system, to transform a system are we just gonna use our cooperatives to protect us within the system that we got? I think that's the question. I was asked to uh, uh, plug my book. So I'm also gonna plug food first. So this is a foodie's guide to capitalism. And uh, it goes into greater depth about all of these issues. Um, I'm pretty happy with this book. And it's going to be on a table out where the books are. And I'll be there too. If you wanna buy a book, I can sign it for you. Um, but I want to give a shout out to Food First because they gave me the support to be able to write this book. Um, you know, they lightened up my bureaucratic role, my administrative role. Um, it still took two years, but <laughs> um, that's not bad for a book. And I want to invite all of you to, if you haven't done so, please go to the Food First website, www.foodfirst.org. We've been around for 42 years. You know, the far right in this country finances their think tanks lavishly. And they produce all kinds of ideological propaganda which shifts 
the converse, social conversation towards the right. Unfortunately, the progressives don't fund their think tanks. They fund projects on the ground. They try to fund things that the government has abandoned. They fund the social services that the government has abandoned under privatization. But that means there's no money for us. So I want to make a very honest appeal to all of you. We are supported by our member donors. Some of our members give us $15 a month. Some give $5 a month, right? Some give quite a bit more because they can. But we have a lot of members who give us very little amounts of money, but they do it consistently because they want to hear our voice. They want this analysis out there. Food First tries to amplify the voices. I mean, I wrote this book, but you should check out a book, other book uh, on the tables called um, Land Justice. That was written by people like you. And we helped them write the book. So we try to amplify the voices of the people on the ground as well, so that you can talk to each other in a powerful way. And I'd like you to invite you to support the institution that does that, Food First. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite people to come.